As we gather together this morning, let us remember that our church building stands on the traditional territory of the Iowa people who called themselves Bahote in their own language. Good morning, and I hope everyone is feeling well. I'm Patty Notch, and I, my pronouns are she, her, and hers. Welcome to our digital service. I am today's celebrant. Barb Martin is our song leader, and Bruce Martin is our pianist. Patty, we can't hear you. I'm unmuted. I can, I can hear, hear her. Yeah. I can hear her fine. I can hear you. Thank Ellen, you. you need to turn your volume up on your own computer. Our pastoral care associate on duty this week is Jim Carty. And our uh, tech person this morning is Walter Pearson. Please keep your microphones muted during the entire service and you are welcome to turn your cameras on. After the service, please feel welcome to stay and turn on your mic and camera and join in a virtual coffee hour, which will not be recorded or live streamed. Good morning. These are opening words for the service today. Two days after Vice President Kamala Harris was sworn in as the nation's first female vice president, Tom Buck, the senior pastor at First Baptist Church in Lindale, Texas, let it out. I can't imagine any truly God-fearing Israelite would have wanted their daughters to view Jezebel as an inspirational role model just because she was a woman in power, tweeted Buck. My problem is her godless character. She not only is the most radical pro-abortion vice president ever, but also the most radical LGBTQ advocate. Patty, would you light our flame? Our gathering song this morning is number 150 in the gray hymnal. You can check the chat for the words. Uh, we'll sing all three verses. Slaves who did. 
Welcome to the First Unitarian Church of Des Moines Digital Service. My name is Patty Notch and my pronouns are she, her, and hers. I'm the celebrant for this morning's service. Whether you are with us for the day or here for a lifetime, we are glad that you have chosen to join us online. Everyone is welcome to join us for a service, whether or not you live in Des Moines or have ever physically been at First Unitarian. Whoever you are, we hope that you find something here today to help you on your life's journey. Good morning again. What you are about to see is the story for all ages today. And you will see a young girl living in India who is describing her experience as a member of the Dalit caste in her small village. The Dalit are the lowest caste in India you may have heard the reference to untouchables. She speaks in her birth language, so you're going to need to focus on the subscripts and they will move very quickly. Thanks, Walter. You'll hear more about this in the relationship of the oldest caste system that we know about in the world to what's going on in the United States at this point as a part of the service today. And Patty, do you wanna take care of the ask? Thank you, Harvey. So that we might continue to welcome all to a place where we share a journey, but not one right answer. The morning offering will now be given and received. If you would like to support First Unitarian Des Moines, there is a link to give in the chat right now, or please go to our website at ucdsm.org and click on give in the top bar on the front page. When the pull down menu opens up, click on online giving and you can put any amount you like in the basket. You can also choose to make a repeating gift. Thanks, Bruce. As a community of human hands and human hearts, we come together here to share our laughter and our tears and to bear witness and minister to one another as we struggle with life's challenges. We especially hold in love anyone who is grieving or heavy hearted today. And I don't have personally a list of any joys and concerns that might have been submitted. Lyra, did we have any this week? I, I did not receive any um, joys and concerns this week. Thanks. So let us bring into this moment anyone we know who could use some special care and attention. As we say their names alive or enter them into the chat room, if you would, may the love of this community hold them all. Mm 
while people are adding names to the chat room. Within our community and across the wider world, there are people who are denied their inherent worth and dignity because of some fact of their inherent humanity, like race or hierarchical status. May the work of our hands and our hearts support and comfort all of those who are marginalized, oppressed, silenced, or at risk. And may we be called to be compassionate action by the needs of those who struggle against violence, degradation, and destruction. May our light shine on the broken places of the world and may we journey in solidarity with all those who fight for equality and justice in human relations. May those who are grieving be comforted. May those who are tired find rest. May the broken places be healed. May those who are filled with joy and laughter be abundant. Bruce. Thanks, Bruce and Barb. First reading is going to be a video today. And what you're going to see is a video that was created by Brian Stevenson's organization, the Equal Justice Initiative. And the video is called A History of Racial Injustice in Our Country. It describes a basis for the caste system in the United States and sets the stage for a great deal of what is unresolved in our country at this moment. It's time for the meditation. In 1857, Frederick Douglass emphasized what have become some of them his most quoted words. Here's what he said. If there is no struggle, there is no progress. Those who profess to favor freedom and yet deprecate agitation want crops without plowing up the ground. They want rain without thunder and lightning. They want the ocean without the awful roar of its many waters. Douglas admonished the crowd, this struggle may be a moral one or it may be a physical one, and it may be both moral and physical, but it must be a struggle. Power concedes nothing without a demand. It never did and it never will. As Douglas knew firsthand, Find out just what a people will quietly submit to, and you have found out the exact measure of injustice and wrong which will be imposed upon them, and these will continue until they are resisted. The limits of tyrants are prescribed only by the endurance of those whom they oppress. And Patty, you want to introduce? Excuse me. We're doing a meditation first of all before that, and then you have to unmute. So take a minute and reflect if you would. Our centering song today is number oh. 170. We are a gentle, angry people. The Hang words on. will Patty. be in the chat screen. Oh. I want to give them a minute just to reflect. I, okay. I, that was, that's on me, sorry. Okay. So take a minute, close your eyes, take a deep breath, and reflect on what you've heard and seen so far in this service.
Patty, back to you. Thanks. Our centering song today is number 170, We Are a Gentle, Angry People. The words will be in the chat screen. Please keep your mics muted and simply sing along at home if you would like. And if you're in the gray hymnal, we're singing verses 1, 2, and 4. Bruce and Barb. Some weeks back, Patty asked if I would be willing to provide an update to the congregation on the racial profiling project, a project I've been working on with others for the past eight years. The goal of the project being to bring an end to racially biased policing in Des Moines, Iowa, and the state. I said yes to Patty without any particular thought about what I might say or how I was going to describe where we presently stand on this journey. So here's the short answer. Notice sitting behind me is a portrait of Edna Griffin. Some of you won't know Edna, but many in the congregation did. She, uh, in 1948, led and organized a protest in Katz Drugstore in downtown Iowa, which then had a counter, counter that was uh, to which black people couldn't come. Edna's action ultimately led to an Iowa Supreme Court case and the very clear statement from the Iowa Supreme Court in 1949 that Iowa's Civil Rights Act prohibited that, i.e. Edna in 1949 uh, integrated public accommodations in Iowa. That's 70 years ago. I started doing the work on racial profiling effort to make change, systemic changes in our state eight years ago. So my short version is it's appalling to me how little progress has been made in the state of Iowa and in Des Moines over the past 78 years, or 70 years, sorry, when I started on this path, the United States had over 2.3 million people in prison. 
When I checked with the sentencing project this week, we now incarcerate over 2.2 million people. We continue to incarcerate in our country a larger percentage of our population than any other country in the world. A disproportionate number of those people are black. And Iowa remains among the worst states in the United States uh, in terms of disproportionate incarceration of people of color. As I noted when I did the first iteration of this service, which was 2013, those of us in my generation, the 60s and 70s, have unfinished business. And if you are interested in the stories and the data that support this statement that we do have a serious problem in the state, it does exist, you can look up the stories and the data on a website that I've helped develop over the past years called Just Voices Iowa. And during these eight years, I've often been asked to explain why this movement of getting racial justice in our community in a state which has prided itself in many ways as being progressive on these issues of civil rights is making so little progress. And I frankly have had trouble explaining it. It has always seemed so obvious to me that the changes that need to be made are for the benefit of and in the self-interest of all of us. I've frequently been disparaging of those who thought otherwise, especially when they could not provide any good reason for their position. Well, today I'm gonna to take a different perspective and talk about new insights that I've received from a book cast, The Origins of Our Discontent by Isabel Wilkerson. I believe it to be a transformative work on the oppression of blacks in the United States. Wilkerson describes how the white landowners in the early eras of the United States and before the United States created this system in the colonial era of our country when they, as she says, took pre-existing notions of their own centrality, reinforced by their self-interested interpretation of the Bible and created a hierarchy of who could do what, who could own what, who is on top and who was on the bottom and who was in between. The ranking that resulted continued on downward until one arrived at the very bottom. African captives transported to build the new world and to serve the victors for all their days, one generation after the next for 12 generations. Ms. Wilkerson uses the framework of this caste system deeply embedded in our institutions and in all of us to describe how systemic racism in our country is maintained she uses the history and the current status of the caste system in India. The young Dalit girl describing her plight in India is a parallel to the plight of young blacks in the United States. She specifically describes the caste system in the United States that has been in place for over 400 years, and then goes on to describe how the United States caste system was utilized in Nazi Germany, <coughs> excuse me, she points out that our system had elements that even the Nazis would not incorporate. So let me start with a story of how this relates to the work I've been doing. In 2014, I was part of the initial racial profiling project. This was a project created through the Amos Juvenile Justice Team and implemented by a group that included Amos, the ACLU of Iowa, the NAACP, and the Drake Legal Clinic. As a part of the project, we interviewed black citizens of Des Moines, largely men, and memorialized their stories of being racially profiled. This work was condensed into a report by the end of 2015, and a copy of that report was provided to the Des Moines Police Department, among others. The hope was that the production of this report would lead to an open dialogue with city officials, particularly the Des Moines Police Department, about the current situation of its black citizens in Des Moines and the steps that could be taken to make necessary changes in the systemic racially biased policing that we clearly exposed. The report clearly identified examples of racial profiling and raised up national statistics and information that supported these stories. The report contained a transcription 
of a communication between the police dispatcher and a patrol car on its way to a gathering of the black community at a public park in Des Moines. The communication contained explicitly racist comments. The response from the Des Moines Police Department to the report in itself and to this particular piece of it was unexpected. I got a phone call from then Major Alan Tunks, who is now the Assistant Chief of Police, and he wanted to talk about the report. But the only reason that Major Tunks called was to find out from me who had provided the recording of that conversation between the dispatcher and a patrol car. When I told him that we weren't going to provide that information to him, he then attacked the transcription, attempting to convince me that it could not possibly be true. He had no interest in any follow-up meetings with regard to the report and dismissed it as a fabrication. That was the full extent of a response from the city officials in Des Moines, Iowa in 2015. In other words, in the fall of 2015, the advocacy community, community presented evidence in the form of that report that had been prepared for a period of over one and a half years, containing references to national materials on racial profiling and actual stories of Des Moines citizens who had been racially pro profiled. And what is most interesting about the response that we got from the police department in the context of Ms. Wilkerson's book is the manner in which it reflects the efforts of the dominant white culture, the oppressor, to discount any information that challenged the existing narrative adopted by that dominant culture. The narrative that defines being black as being criminal, as being lesser than, as being other. This response was an early warning shot on what has followed in the subsequent years. In submitting the report and calling for systemic changes in racially biased policing, I should have remembered the words from Frederick Douglass with which I introduced the meditation. Those words were echoed 100 years later by Dr. King when he said also, freedom is never voluntarily given by the oppressor. It must be demanded by the oppressed. By the fall of 2018, the police chief was refusing to even meet at all with members of the advocacy community. He had actually had a couple of meetings with us uh, in which he gave no quarter at all about the narrative that uh, there was no racial profiling and there was no racially biased policing in Des Moines. So in response and following a series of, me of meetings at Iowa Citizens for Community Improvement, which is a community-based activist organization. We submitted a list of six demands to the Des Moines City Council. These demands were one, to pass an ordinance to ban racial profiling, two, to end pretextual stops, three, to collect and evaluate accurate and complete data regarding all police stops, four, to create a citizens review board to hold the police accountable, fifth, to enhance training for a policy and implicit bias and de-escalation, and finally, to make simple possession of marijuana a low police department enforcement priority. We waited and nothing happened after that was submitted to the council. By the winter of 2020, it was obvious that city officials and particularly the chief of police were planning on taking as little action as possible on these demands. In other words, the advocacy community was getting nowhere. We were being stonewalled. It was not until the murder of George Floyd on May 29th of 2020 and the outpouring of protesters onto the streets of Des Moines and around the country that the city council in June 2020 finally took a timid first and small first step by adopting an ordinance that in fact did ban racial profiling it did not end pretextual stops. It didn't talk about data collection. They absolutely refused to create a citizens review board. Uh, while we have implicit bias training in Des Moines, there was nothing about de-escalation. And while the Des Moines City Council put in place a task force to examine what could be done about reducing enforcement of marijuana laws, 
Now, nothing has happened since, even though a really, really good report was submitted by the task force that was created. So basically, what I'm describing to you is that in all of that time, nothing has really changed about racially biased policing and racially racial profiling in Des Moines. So the question remains, why would the Des Moines City Council and the police be so hesitant to adopt the demands of the black community? Why is the chief of police even unwilling to engage in an open dialogue about racially biased policing in Des Moines, especially when the evidence that we have collected and presented so clearly demonstrates the problem? And also there's no question around the United States now that there are places where that's actually being done. Even more, we can clearly demonstrate that the changes being requested will be in everyone's best interest and not just in the interest of the black and brown communities, but everyone. Oddly enough, I watched a um, Zoom meeting yesterday that put on by some folks in Cleveland where they pointed out that historically some of the things that are now in the demands that are being refused actually were proposed by the conservative voices in the United States over the past 70 years. Well, I now have a better answer in some ways than I have over the years to that why question. And Wilkerson points us at the answer. It is the same answer and the same reason as to why 74 million people would vote for Donald Trump, a man so obviously unfit for public office at any level that it is inconceivable to people like me great grandchildren of the enlightenment, if you will, that he could ever be elected to any public office. This is where Ms. Wilkerson utilizes the framework of the caste system to demonstrate how it has left blacks in the United States in the lowest position within the hierarchy of that system and the consequences of that. And she demonstrates how the dominant culture in this country, what I have referred to as the oppressors, almost all white, and almost all male will use every means available to retain power and status in this system, up to and including the overthrow of our constitutional system of government by calling for an insurrection or choosing to ignore and discredit any report or actual evidence that challenges the dominant narrative and the embedded power of the white ruling class. Since blacks are at the bottom of their caste system, giving credence to any claim of racial bias, even when demonstrably clear, represents an existential threat to the maintenance of control by the dominant class. This would not and cannot be countenanced. On a very personal level, it brings into sharp focus my misunderstanding of how deeply this is embedded in our country. I can't tell you how many times over the past years I have said that I did not understand how people could be so easily manipulated into voting and acting against their own self-interest. Ms. Wilkerson uncovers the blindness of that comment. My definition of self-interest has ignored those primal motivations that include maintenance and preservation of my status as a white male against all efforts to make change. The past 50 years have shown once again, how effectively the means of control can evolve and morph to retain even increase in some instances that control. This is how Jonathan Sachs describes this phenomenon in his latest book released just before his recent death. Time and time again, the West has overestimated human rationality, most notably in the 18th century in the form of the Enlightenment and underestimated the power of our tribal passions. Whether focused on nation, religion, ethnicity, political party, or the myriad other ways we define who and what we are. We are social animals, he says. For hundreds of thousands of years, our hunter-gatherer ancestors lived in small groups, and that has left an indelible mark on our psychology. From this derives much of what is the best as well as much of what is worst of human nature. We are by and large altruistic toward the members of our own group, 
and at least potentially aggressive toward members of other groups, especially when we see them as threatening to our own. As Ms. Wilkerson demonstrates the dominant culture, those of us who are identified as white have received and perceived benefits of this system for more than 400 years. And every person who identifies as white in this country, including all of us in this service, are complicit in the maintenance of this oppressive system. This is a basic oppression theory translated through the lens of, cl of cl caste. When I apply that lens to the work that I've been doing over the past eight years to trans form our system of racially biased policing, I now come to the realization that the self-interest that is being protected goes to the very heart and soul of how we who are identified as white understand our very existence, of how as the demographics of our country change and we look forward to becoming a racial minority, all of our historic narratives about our place in the universe our inherent superiority, our inherent exceptionalism are proved to be lies. If we can no longer identify people whose skin is darker than ours as less than, as criminal, as other, as Jezebels, as welfare queens, where does that leave me? The lens destroys the idea that when my skin color is perceived and defined as white, I can claim superiority over those whose skin is darker. Ms. Wilkerson describes this phenomenon in the context of political elections and why so many of us were wrong in believing that Donald Trump could never be elected to the presidency of the United States. She puts it this way. What the left had not considered was that the people voting this way were in fact voting for their interests. Maintaining the caste system as it had always been was in their interest and some were willing to accept short-term discomfort, forego health insurance, risk contamination of the water and air, and even die to protect their long-term interest in the hierarchy as they had known it. When you are caught in a caste system, she says, you will likely do whatever it takes to survive in it. If you are in securely situated somewhere in the middle, below the very top, but above the very bottom caste, you may distance yourself from the bottom and hold up barriers against those you see as below you to protect your own position. You will emphasize the inherited characteristics that rank higher on the caste scale. When that minister described Kamala Harris as a Jezebel, he was doing far more than calling her an amoral, wantonly sexual woman, which is the modern narrative apparently attached to her story. He was tapping into those primal fears that this woman whose skin is darker than his might actually supplant him in the caste hierarchy. And the people listening to him, his white congregation, are triggered by this statement in ways that Donald Trump has been able to trigger people. Ms. Wilkerson's book is a disturbing read, brilliantly written and marvelously readable. And the problem I have this morning is I don't really know where I will go with the new insights that she has provided to me. I do know that I believe that every child in this world, from that Dalit child in India to every child in this country, deserves to be free of any limitations based on perceived race. I don't really anticipate that my work, what I now call my calling in retirement, will be finished in my lifetime. I do maintain the hope, probably once again proving that I am a naive great-grandchild of the Enlightenment, that reason, along with the recognition that all humans, regardless of perceived race, are entitled to an equitable and fair life. I will share with you again, as I've shared with you before, that this journey has transformed me in ways that are almost impossible to explain. I fully expect to stay on this journey for the rest of my life. That of course leads to the question of with these new insights, uh, how do I not get lost? Well, fortunately for me, Brian Stevenson of the Equal Justice Initiative has provided a map of how to stay on course. And 
I believe that in a moment you're going to actually get to look on it in the screen. Walter, would you, if, you, if you've got it handy, raise up the four elements that Stevenson describes. What Brian Stevenson says is that if you really want to lean toward justice and implement actions toward justice, then we must get proximate. Or in the wonderful worlds of Renee Brown, which I really like, frankly, if, you're, if you aren't in the arena also getting your ass kicked, I'm not interested in your feedback. Second thing that Stevenson says, and apparently we don't get to see the video of it right now, okay. We must change the narrative that was created to justify and support th this immoral system. The demeaning narratives that inculcate our culture with negative stereotypes of people who are not identified as white and the equally destructive narratives that reinforce white exceptionalism. Third, he says that stay hopeful. And that's sometimes very hard to do when I describe how this process has been stalled and stonewalled um, in trying to make the transformations that we're talking about. But if you're going to continue, you've got to stay hopeful. And finally, what he says is that for all of us, every single one of us, if we want to make change, we must be willing to do uncomfortable things in order to make the changes that are needed. So that's the path I'm on. I certainly invite the rest of you to join me on it if you're so moved. So thank you for being here. Thank you for your attention. And Patty, would you go back in time to extinguish the flame? We extinguish this flame, but never the light of reason, the warmth of compassion, or the fire of commitment within our community. Bruce, you're up. We go out into the break rooms which are going to be available this morning for people i've closed almost every speech i've given for the past at least six years with this quote from dr king and i think it's just as appropriate today as it has been the other times let nobody give you the impression that the problem of racial injustice will work itself out let nobody give you the impression that only time will solve the problem that is a myth and it is a myth because time is neutral. It can be used either constructively or destructively. And I'm absolutely convinced that the people of ill will in our nation, the extreme rightists, the forces committed to negative ends have used time much more efficiently and effectively than the people of goodwill. It may well be that we will have to repent in this generation, not merely for the vitriolic works and violent actions, of the bad people who bomb a church in Birmingham, Alabama, or shoot down a civil rights worker in Selma, but for the appalling silence and indifference of the good people who sit around and say, wait on time. Somewhere, we must come to see that human progress never rolls in on the wheels of inevitability. It comes through the timeless efforts and the persistent work of dedicated individuals. Without this hard work, time becomes an ally of the primitive forces of social stagnation. So we must help time and realize that the time is always right to do right. Thank you all.